Water is the most abundant nutrient in your body, accounting for over 60% of your body weight. In your body, water plays many important roles, one of which is serving as the solvent of life. All cells, all tissues in your body are bathed in a water-based or aqueous solution in which many things are dissolved. These dissolved substances are called solutes. Some of the most important solutes found in your body that make up your body fluids are electrolytes. Electrolytes are substances that are created through ionic bonds, but when they're dissolved in water, break into positively charged cations and negatively charged anions. In this video, we'll talk about how your body seeks to maintain fluid and electrolyte balance and the importance of doing so with respect to human nutrition and physiology. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Water is sometimes referred to as the central molecule of life. And this is because water plays so many important roles in all biological systems that life couldn't exist if water didn't have the properties that it had and wasn't present in such abundant amounts as it is in all living systems. In fact, in all living things, including human beings, water makes up more than 60% of the body weight uh, of, of those systems. Water plays numerous important roles, and we'll talk about a couple of them today. One of the most important which is serving as the solvent of life. Water is referred to as the solvent of life because almost all bodily fluids, whether we're talking about saliva, blood, or mucus, are those, those solutions are all aqueous in nature, meaning that water is acting as the base of that, and all of the things in that particular solution must be able to dissolve in water or at least to a certain extent, be carried by water. Other important roles for water in biological systems is serving as a lubricant and cushioning agent. For example, if we look at the fluid uh, that, that is contained within our joints, that fluid is a water-based fluid that helps, to cushion, that helps to cushion our joints and to help it make it easier so the bones can interact without being damaged. Water is the base component representing about 90% of mucus. And I know mucus seems kind of gross and disgusting, but mucus is a hugely important part of your body. That's why we have numerous things called mucus membranes. Mucus lines our gastrointestinal tract. It, it exists in our lungs. It's an important component of helping keeping things move through our body, but it also helps to act as part of our first line of defense to prevent things that are harmful, harmful pathogens from entering our body. Water also plays a very important thermoregulatory role in our body. As mentioned in one of my previous videos about water, water has an extremely high heat capacity, which means it takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of water. And that's a great thing considering that we are 60% water, which means it's kind of hard to change our body temperature. And when our body temperature does begin to change, there are nerves that are contained within our skin and sensory nerves that exist in the hypothalamus of our brain that are able to detect those changes in temperature. The hypothalamus is really the, the heat regulatory center or the thermal regulatory center of our body. And when the, when the hypothalamus detects changes in body temperature, it sends out signals to affect our nerves throughout our body to either help cool our body down or to help heat our body up. One of the most important ways our body acts to cool down is producing a fluid known as sweat, which again is highly water-based. The majority of sweat is water, but some of the other components of sweat that are important are substances known as electrolytes. And electrolytes are some of the most important, important solutes dissolved inside in, in, in water-based fluids in our body. As I mentioned in the intro, electrolytes are substances that enter our body typically in the form of salt. They're formed through ionic bonds, and when they dissolve in water, they break into their constituent parts, which are positively charged cations, substances such as sodium and potassium, and negatively charged anions, such as chloride. These electrolytes play numerous important roles in our body, and the focus of this video is going to be, is going to be learning how our body maintains fluid balance, which means how our body is able to regulate the amount of water that is present inside of it, as well as electrolyte balance. 
because maintaining a proper amount of fluids and electrolytes in our body is essential for our body to behave normally. But this ties into nutrition because our ability to consume adequate amounts of water and adequate amounts of electrolytes from our diet is essential for maintaining fluid, fluid and electrolyte balance and maintaining normal health. So first, let's start by focusing on water. How does our body regulate the amount of water that we have in it? How does it know when we need to consume water and when we don't? Well, one of the things that happens is that there are, there are organs in our body whose job it is to sort of monitor the concentration of dissolved solutes in the water. This is reflected scientifically as a term known as osmolarity. Osmolarity refers to the number of dissolved solutes present in a fluid. So when we look at, for example, human blood, when we look at the osmolarity, if the osmolarity is high, that says there are more dissolved solutes relative to the amount of water in that particular solution. That might indicate that there is not enough water present and that more water needs to be added. There are actually specific organs, things like the kidneys and the hypothalamus of the brain, which act to sense the osmolarity of water. And when they detect either a low, that, when they detect that there's too little fluid or more often high concentrations of an electrolyte called sodium present in the bloodstream, they recognize that the osmolarity is high. This then indicates that you need to consume more water. So how does it do that? Well, it sends messages to the hypothalamus in the form of hormones, or if it's detected directly by the hypothalamus, which also serves as a search center of the brain, this is gonna cause the hypothalamus to send out cues to your body. What happens is the hypothalamus, which is part of your unconscious brain, then sends messages to the cortex, the conscious part of your brain, that says, hey, you're thirsty, go drink something. Then once you find fluids, you consume those fluids, and then the muscle movements that occur as you are drinking actually act to send signals to the other part of your brain that basically says, hey, we've now consumed water and we're fine. And the body goes back, it sort of turns off the thirst, the thirst sensation, tells you you don't need to drink anymore, and then it begins to sort of reassess what your fluid levels are like. And if you're still thirsty, it will tell you to drink more. This is one of the neat ways in which your body actually maintains fluid balance by telling you whether you're thirsty or not. And it turns out that a lot of that actually happens in your kidneys as well as in your brain. We'll learn a little bit more about that later. So how much water do we need on a daily basis and where does the water that we lose, where does it go? Well, it turns out that you lose about two and a half liters of water every day. A lot of that actually leaves uh, through means that are, are undetected by you. They, uh, are, they are lost through things like exhalation and through the skin. You sort of don't know what's happening there. The remainder of that is actually going to leave through urination, and urination is how one of the ways in which our body um, removes fluids and removes um, other things that are dissolved in water from our body. So we have to replace about two and a half liters of water every day, but that doesn't mean you have to drink two and a half liters of water every day. It turns out that you're going to get about 300 to 400 milliliters of water produced just as a result of your normal metabolic processes. Water is actually a byproduct of your cell's metabolism. You also get about 700 mils or so uh, from the solid foods that you eat. We don't typically think about it, but a lot of the foods we eat, things like oranges and fruits uh, and vegetables, they actually have a high water content as well, right? They're living things. So 60% of what you're eating of them often is water. What that means is there's about a liter and a half on an average day, assuming that you're not doing intense exercise, that you need to replace through fluid consumption. Um, you know, water is often the best case scenario, right? Water has very few dissolved, uh, very few dissolved things in it, especially if it's pure water. It also is calorie free. Um, so you're not, you know, you're getting like, it's like 100% nutrient dense, right? Remember we talked about that term in one of my previous videos, uh, because you're getting the nutrient that you need water, uh, without getting any calorie consumption. However, there are lots of other beverage choices out there and you can also use fluid intake to sort of couple with meeting your nutritional needs, consuming, um, healthy, you know, vegetable juices, uh, things like tomato juice or V8. But what we want to try to avoid in many cases are some of those empty calorie drinks, things like soda. Uh, or sugary fruit juices, because yes, in some cases we are getting some of the nutrients that we need, but quite often that's coming at a pretty high caloric price, which means you're getting a lot of those empty calories along with it. One exception might be people who do, um, who are doing that, that do a lot of physical activity, endurance athletes, for example, or people who do a lot of strenuous work under heat conditions. 
if you remember, one of the reasons why that might be the case is because when our bodies are hot, one of the ways that we thermoregulate, one of the ways that the hypothalamus, for example, tells our body to cool off is by producing sweat. And sweat is a water-based solution, um, but it contains a lot of, of those electrolytes. So when you sweat, you're not just losing water. You are losing a significant amount of water, but you're also losing things like sodium and chloride that needs to be replaced. This is actually uh, something that can be replaced using uh, sports drinks. So one of the most famous of which is Gatorade. So Gatorade was developed in the 1960s um, at the University of Florida. The Florida football coaches actually realized that, hey, their players were having we're struggling a lot and one of the reasons why is in august and september when you know practice is going on at the beginning of the season it is really really hot in the state of florida and they're all dressed up in pads and and they would basically sort of crash and the reason why was they were suffering from a fluid and electrolyte imbalance so they developed uh, gatorade as a way of replacing both water and electrolytes at the same time the thing that you need to realize about sports drinks, which has now become this multi-billion dollar industry and you know everybody consumes them, you can buy them uh, when you go to fast food restaurants as your drink along with water, juice, or soda. Sports drinks have a role and they can be very important, particularly in replacing electrolytes when people are out doing very strenuous exercise, sweating a lot, or losing a lot of fluids. But, but, most sports drinks aren't calorie free. They also contain a significant amount of calories. It's not just water and electrolytes, but also a lot of sugar. They're not a lot better for you than most sodas are. So when you go out to walk your dog or uh, you go for a bike ride with your family, you don't need to bring a uh, you don't need to bring a Gatorade or a Powerade with you. You don't need a sports drink. You're not losing that many electrolytes that you need to replace it with a sports drink. So again, be smart about what you're choosing to replace that one and a half liters of water you should be consuming on a regular basis. So urine production and maintaining fluid and electrolyte balance is in large part controlled by what happens at the kidneys. So the kidneys have a job of filtering out what goes through your blood and, and your kidneys actually filter over 100 liters of blood a day. Um, and they'll take about a liter and a half of that in a healthy person on a regular day and turn that into urine. Um, and what happens with urine is it's not only a way of, of ridding the body of excess fluids, but it also gets rid of, it's also going to contain electrolytes, things like potassium, chloride, and sodium. The kidneys can also filter things out and reabsorb them. So uh, if your body doesn't want to shed all of its sodium, which it probably doesn't want to do, the kidneys are very efficient at reabsorbing it. But how does the, how do the kidneys actually know whether or not um, you need to get more fluids? Well, it does it through a pretty cool mechanism by sort of indirectly measuring blood pressure as a function of how those blood vessels that surround the kidneys stretch when blood comes through it. And if there's not a lot of stretch, if there's not a lot of pressure inside of those blood vessels, that's an indication that there's not enough fluid in your blood. And what happens is the kidneys then produce a hormone called renin. And renin then leads to the secretion of another hormone called angiotensin. And angiotensin can be sensed by the hypothalamus, it can be sensed by the adrenal glands that sit on top of the kidneys, as well as certain muscles that sit around the blood vessels. And angiotensin acts to sort of uh, boost your, you know, sort of rectify the low blood pressure situation. Now, the adrenal glands can also help. When they sense that angiotensin, they can release a hormone known as aldosterone uh, that can help and send more signals to the body that we need to get more fluids. Uh, the, the adrenal glands can actually directly sense whether there is a high level of sodium in the um, in, in the blood as well as a low level of potassium. Both of those are also signals for the adrenal gland to release, the adrenal glands to release aldosterone. These can all be sensed by the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus, remember, is the thirst center for your brain and actually triggers the response of, hey, you're thirsty, can you rectify this situation by drinking water? The hypothalamus, as I mentioned before, can also directly detect whether or not you need to get more fluid. So working together, the kidneys, the, the, uh, the adrenal glands and the hypothalamus all act to sort of monitor whether or not you have enough fluid in your body, whether there is enough water in your body, and trigger the thirst response to sort of rectify that situation so that blood pressure as well as fluid and electrolyte balance remain relatively constant. So why is fluid balance so important? Well, the reason has to do with how aqueous solutions behave and how our cells and other living tissues interact with those water-based solutions. 
So remember, earlier in the video I mentioned a concept known as osmolarity. Osmolarity refers to the number of dissolved solutes that are present in a, in a solution. So if a solution has high osmolarity, that means there are a lot of dissolved solutes. It could also mean that there's just not a lot of water. Low osmolarity, conversely, would mean that there is a lot of water and ha there are very few dissolved solutes. The thing is this, your body, as well as the bodies of all living organisms, seek to maintain homeostasis. They don't want things that, they, what you don't want is the osmolarity of your bodily fluids changing too much in any one direction. And the reason is because all of the cells and the tissues in your body are separated from the outside environment by semi-permeable membranes. Now I'm going to do sort of an overview of of osmolarity, tonicity, and membrane transport. But I have a whole other video that goes into this topic in great detail. So I would really encourage you to go back and watch my video on, on biological membranes and transport because this will give you a much better concept of what's going on. But in short, what we need to remember about how cells behave in solution is that semi-permeable membranes only allow certain things to pass across, uh, certain things to pass across them freely. And, uh, and biological membranes, um, cells are packed full of transport proteins that allow the movement of water freely back and, back and forth across the membrane. These transport proteins are known as aquaporins. Other things have a much harder time getting across the membrane, and some of those things are anything that has a charge, i.e. electrolytes. So what can happen when, we get in, when cells are placed into solution? Water is going to flow naturally just like all substances, from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Okay, We often refer to this as things that are going down their gradient. So for example, if we have a lot of one substance on the side of a biological membrane and less of it on the other, the natural movement, the natural desire is for those substances to go down their gradient, go from an area of high concentration to low. And water is actually no exception to that. But because cells have these transport proteins known as aquaporins that aren't really regulated, water can more or less freely flow across the biological membrane from an area where it's highly concentrated, i.e. an area with low osmolarity, to an area where it is less concentrated, an area with high osmolarity. So if your cells find themselves in solutions that don't have equal osmolarity on either side, that's going to cause water to flow into the cells or out of the cells. This is a concept that we often refer to as tonicity. Solutions that have a high amount of dissolved solutes are referred to as hypertonic. Solutions that have a low amount of dissolved solutes are referred to as hypotonic. Kind of it kind of dovetails nicely with, with the concept of osmolarity. Now, cells have a relatively set osmolarity, and the reason why is because those dissolved solutes, things like sodium, chloride, um, things like sugar, they cannot very easily get across the biological membranes, but water can. So what happens is that when cells are placed in a solution that is hypertonic, i.e. the outside, the extracellular environment is hypertonic, it's going to shrivel. And the reason why is water is going to go from where there is low concentration or from high concentration inside the cell out into the fluid to try to balance things out to balance out that hypertonic solution. If you place a cell inside of a hypotonic solution where there's more water outside of the cell, water is going to rush in to try to rectify that. This is the concept uh, that we refer to as water follows salt. Where there's more salt, water is going to try to get to it to sort of balance out the equation so that there's an equal amount of dissolved solutes on either side of the membrane. Why don't the salts go across the membrane? They can't because they have positive or negative charges. So the water's got to go to the salt. This is an important concept. What we try to do is maintain isotonicity. Isotonic solutions are solutions that have the same amount of dissolved solute. So for example, if a patient has to undergo surgery or needs to be rehydrated, we don't give them pure water. And the reason we don't give them pure water is pure water is hypotonic because your cells all have dissolved solutes, pure water doesn't. And the end result could actually be very harmful. We give them things like lactated ringers that, have, that are isotonic. They have the same amount of dissolved solutes. So it doesn't change the fluid and electrolyte balance in your body when we rehydrate you. So as I said, that's sort of a brief overview of, of tonicity and osmolarity. If you want more of a detailed uh, conversation about this, I, I, again, I recommend going to see my previous video on, on membrane transport. There's a lot more details about this. 
Now, some of the most important things, as I've mentioned before, that are dissolved in your biological fluids are electrolytes. The big three electrolytes that we'll talk about in this video are sodium, potassium, and chloride. And the reason why is the majority of, of what goes on in your body is sort of tied to these electrolytes. There are other ones that are involved, but they're sort of minor components and they, we're not going to focus on them in this video. Now, as I said, your body works very hard to maintain homeostasis. This is sort of maintaining a balance, right? But one of the interesting things about your, your body, as well as like the cells of all living things, is one of the ways in which they maintain balance is by keeping some of your electrolytes out of balance, which seems a bit odd, but bear with me. This is done through the activity of a transport protein that exists in all living cells in some one way or another. It's called the sodium potassium ATPase or the sodium potassium exchanger. In all of your cells, you have this protein who has a job. The job of this protein is to create artificial gradients. It's to make sure that the sodium and the potassium levels inside of the cell don't line up. Okay. And it does this artificially. Of course, we're, we're moving things against the natural way, right? We're moving things from areas of low concentration to high, to high concentration. This requires energy. And like all other processes in your cell, when it needs energy, it uses ATP to do so. That's why it's called an ATPase. The sodium potassium ATPase takes three sodium ions from inside the cell and pushes them outside. And in exchange for that, it takes two potassium ions from outside of the cell and brings them in. The net result is to create a vast pool of sodium ions outside of the cell across the plasma membrane where they can't get back in because they have a charge. It also creates a vast pool of potassium ions inside of the cell. So there's a high concentration of potassium inside and a low concentration outside. We've now created two gradients, sodium that's trying to get in and potassium that's trying to get out. We'll talk about why we might do this in a minute, but stay with me. So. A couple things we have to realize. This is what's referred to as an electrical chemical gradient. Why an electrochemical gradient? Well, it's twofold. First off, we know that two chemical gradients exist, right? Sodium and potassium. Sodium's at high concentration inside, and uh, sorry, potassium's at high concentration inside, and sodium's at high concentration outside of the cell. But there's also an electrical gradient there. Why? Well, we put three positive charges outside and we brought two positive charges in which means, relatively speaking, there is a negative charge inside of all of your cells and a positive charge outside. Your cells literally have a voltage across your membrane. You are quite literally electric, as are all living things, because of this charge differential. But why do this? Well, the answer is kind of cool. It's because electrochemical gradients are a form of potential energy. And what we now know is all of your cells do this because what we can do is not you have to think of an electrical chemical gradient like a waterfall. Waterfalls work to produce energy because they also represent potential energy. The water at the top of a waterfall has significantly higher gravitational potential energy, and the water at the bottom has very low potential energy, gravitational potential energy. And as water flows over the waterfall, energy gets released. We then harness some of that with turbines to produce electricity. Your cells can do the same thing. It can actually use those existing sodium or potassium gradients to power the transport of materials against their gradient across the cell. It's sort of like a, an exchange process. So for example, um, sodium can be utilized to move things like glucose, amino acids, and even water into your intestinal cells. Why would it do that? Because that's how things get in your bloodstream. So when we take in food and for example, we break down carbohydrates to yield glucose, even if you've eaten a huge meal, the glucose concentration in your intestine is significantly lower than that inside of your intestinal cells. It's just a volume thing. So how do we get glucose into your intestinal cells? Well, it's simple. Sodium wants to go in, right? Because sodium has a huge concentration outside and very little inside. So it's favorable. So what happens is you have these specific transport proteins that allow you to bring glucose in against this gradient, i.e., requires energy by exchanging a sodium ion going in with it. It basically says, well, this is sort of, this is energetically neutral. I'm paying for my glucose transport with the transport of a sodium. You're doing one thing that you don't want to do in exchange for doing one thing that you do want to do. And it's a net wash. So in a sense, the reason why your body and all cells use this sodium potassium ATP is, is it basically sets up sort of a way of paying for your transport of other things against their gradient. And without this sodium gradient, glucose, amino acids, and even water wouldn't be able to flush through your, uh, through the, um, 
through your intestinal cells and eventually into the bloodstream. That's all done through movement of electrolytes. And that's just one great example of how important electrolytes actually are. So what I want to do now is go through uh, and discuss why specific electrolytes, sodium, chloride, and potassium are so important. I want to talk about what they do in the cells, the different functions that they have, the different processes uh, that they're involved in, where we get them from, and what happens if we don't have enough of them. So we'll start with sodium. Um, sodium is probably the most prominent cation uh, in the extracellular space. And why is it so prominent out there? Remember, the sodium potassium ATPase of all cells is rapidly removing sodium from the inside of the cells and pushing it outside, establishing that gradient. So if you're looking outside of cells and you're looking for positively charged ions, it's going to be sodium that you're going to find. So we've talked before about how important sodium is for fluid balance, right? Sodium can be, in, can, can be indirectly detected in the kidneys. It can be directly detected by the adrenal glands and the hypothalamus. And if sodium levels are high in the bloodstream, that likely indicates that, hey, we need to take on more fluids. It's one of the reasons why um, sodium might be linked to hypertension, right? Because uh, if you're consuming too much sodium from salt, well, then you might end up uh, having issues in terms of fluid and electrolyte balance because your body's perceiving you as needing to take on more water. Okay, um, so what else does sodium do other than fluid balance? Well, um, it's also, as I mentioned, involved in the transport of nutrients. When, uh, when you want to bring glucose or amino acids from protein meals into your intestinal cells and then eventually into the bloodstream so they can be circulated, that all depends on the influx of sodium. Bringing sodium into the cells pays the energetic cost of bringing in amino acids and glucose. But also remember, that's how water is going to make it into your bloodstream as well. Because when you digest that water, and sodium enters into those cells, well, it's going to bring water with it. Water follows salt. So when sodium comes in, it's going to change the, it's going to change the osmolarity of those cells. And in doing so, it's going to make the cells be somewhat hypertonic. Water is going to, ru water is going to rush into those cells to sort of bounce out of that equation and then eventually make it into the bloodstream um, as it crosses through those biological membranes. Uh, another major thing that sodium is involved in is uh, nerve impulses. So nerve impulses are obviously hugely important for how our bodies work. And it turns out that your nerve impulses are basically due to the activity of sodium. So how does this work? Um, remember that neurons are just cells, right? So um, they have the sodium potassium ATPase. And in fact, in some neurons, um, the sodium ATPase uses somewhere between 33 and 50% of all resting um, ATP consumption. That's how hugely important the sodium potassium ATPase is in these cells to maintain that gradient. And the reason why is uh, cell or nerve cells or neurons that haven't been triggered yet are referred to as being polarized. They have a pole. They are polarized. There's a big positive charge outside and a big negative charge inside. It's that electrical gradient that we talked about, right? Well, when a nerve needs to fire, what it does is it actually opens up all of these sodium channels and allows sodium to rush into the cell. And this current, quite literally, of sodium travels from the, the body of the neuron down something called the axon. And when it reaches the axon, it triggers the release of neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters actually then signal to the next cell in the process to do the same thing that that neuron just did. That neuron just fired. Okay? So uh, that next cell down the line might be another neuron. And if it's another neuron, that cell is also going to depolarize by allowing sodium to come in and propagate that signal further down the nerve until it reaches its destination. Now the destination is often a muscle cell and that neuron might be sending a signal to contract and if that muscle cell is going to contract, guess what? It's also going to depolarize in a process that is dependent upon sodium. So what happens now, because you've just fired a neuron and you've got all the sodium back in the cell, how do we reset that neuron for the next transmission? It's simple. The sodium potassium ATPase actually kicks back on and sends sodium uh, back out of the cell, repolarizing it and waiting for the next signal to come. And without sodium, this wouldn't be possible. There's also a cool story involving potassium and in all this. Remember, potassium is in high concentrations inside of the cell. One of the ways that we sort of turn off and reset that neuron is by exchanging so potassium. So as sodium comes in, potassium leaves the cell. This sort of reverses that electric current that's going through, acts to blunt, and then eventually turn off that nerve impulse, allowing for the sodium potassium ATPase to come back on and reset it by putting potassium back into the cell and kicking sodium back out of the cell. So given how important sodium is for these different biological processes, um, it probably comes to mind that not having enough sodium could be a problem. And you're right. A situation of having too little sodium is referred to as hyponatremia. So hypo obviously means under, but where does the term natremia 
can come from. So at this point, you might be wondering, for example, why um, is the chemical symbol for sodium Na? And why are we referring to a condition where you have low sodium as hyponatremia? Well, it actually goes back to the fact that when atomic symbols were first being assigned, uh, sodium wasn't known as sodium. It was known at, by its old or its new Latin name, natrium. Um, so consequently, we get the atomic symbol Na and we get the terms hypo and hypernatremia. We're actually going to see something, something different, uh, something very similar with potassium. Uh, you may have noticed that the atomic symbol for potassium is K. Um, and we'll find out that uh, having too little potassium uh, is known as hypokalemia and too much potassium is hyperkalemia. Uh, and that's because the new Latin name for potassium was calium um, that we now call it potassium. So um, just sort of weird science history thing for you there. So back to our conversation about what happens when you get too little sodium. So hyponatremia can occur in a couple of different ways. Um, you can imagine, first off, not getting enough sodium in your diet. Um, would lead to hyponatremia. But that's very, very unlikely because you know getting sodium is very easy. It's very bioavailable. Um, and honestly, consuming too little sodium is hardly a problem. You also lose a fair amount of sodium through the excretion of sweat. Um, but to actually become hyponatremic as a result of sweat, you really need to put out a lot of sweat. And quite honestly, that's hard to do. Um, one of the most common ways to actually become hyponatremic is actually to get too much water. So remember, when we measure the concentration of sodium, it can occur either way. Too little sodium could mean that there are very, very low intake of sodium relative to the amount of water you have. Or if you get too much water but don't change the sodium cons don't change the amount of sodium that's there, that also results in a low sodium level, right? A low sodium concentration. It's, are you changing the numerator, i.e. bringing in too little sodium, or are you changing the denominator, i.e. bringing in too much water? Okay, so this is a situation known as water intoxication, and it is a potentially fatal condition. So water intoxication is actually a very serious condition. Um, you know, people, endurance athletes have been known to get this when they try to stay too hydrated, essentially. Um, they overconsume water because they think they're losing more than they are. Um, you end up, uh, they can feel nauseated, they can get muscle cramps, dizziness, um, they can be confused, and then eventually they can actually go into a coma and potentially die um, if the conditions are severe enough. Um, one particularly um, tragic and uh, you know, illustrative case of this actually happened with a woman named Jennifer Strange back in 2007. Uh, she was participating in a radio game show called hold your Wii for a Wii," where contestants were given a bottle of water every 15 minutes which they had to consume and then whoever consumed the most amount of water without urinating got to win a nintendo Wii. uh jennifer strange actually ended up getting second place in this contest um, and consumed over by best estimates over two gallons of water um, before the contest was over on the way home she actually called a friend said she had a, an incredible headache and felt ill and she was going to go home and lie down the friend later checked on her, told her mom to go over and take a look, and when they went over, they found out that she was dead. Uh, the coroner later concluded that she had actually died of water intoxication. She had consumed so much water that she became hyponatremic and actually died a result, as a result of that. What happens when you become hyponatremic or when you suffer from water intoxication is essentially you turn your blood and other bodily fluids into hypotonic solutions. Because they're hypotonic, water is now going to rush into those cells. It's going to cause your body cells to swell. Some of them might even burst, but either way, they're not going to function properly. And essentially, most body functions begin to shut down as a result of that. And that is why hyponatremia is such a problematic condition. So how can endurance athletes or people who maybe are losing a lot of sweat sort of prevent this from happening? One, don't necessarily overconsume water. Um, your body has a pretty good gauge, as we learned before, of when you're thirsty. If you're thirsty, drink water. If you're not thirsty, you're probably okay. Uh, another thing that you can do is to actually consume sports drinks. So again, if you're taking your dog for a walk, you probably don't need to bring a Gatorade with you. But if you know you're going to run several miles or uh, you're going to participate in a soccer match or you're at practice for football in the heat of August, then you probably should bring something to help replace both fluids and electrolytes at the same time. So how much sodium do we actually need? Well, the Institute of Medicine um, has set forth guidelines um, that are referred to as adequate intakes or AIs. Uh, and the IOM's AI, to use all the acronyms, uh, for sodium is about 1,500 milligrams per day. So it's a gram and a half. 
Um, but to be fair, to get the AI that you need, it's literally two thirds of a, a teaspoon of salt. It's really not a lot because your body is so efficient at reabsorbing uh, sodium, it really doesn't let it go all that much. So you really don't need that much sodium in your diet to maintain adequate electrolyte levels under normal conditions. It also sets what's called the upper tolerable limit or the UL. Um, and for most adults, 19 to 50, that UL is around um, 2,300 milligrams. Now, to be clear, the IOM states that individuals that have certain conditions, chronic kidney disease, are over 50 years of age or diabetic, uh, they recommend an AI um, that is slightly lower than 1,500 milligrams, usually around 12 or 1,300 milligrams. And the American Heart Institute, owing to some recent um, some recent scientific studies that link high levels of sodium to uh, high blood pressure or hypertension recommends that all Americans get less than what the IOM recommends for its AI. It actually recommends somewhere between 1200 and 1300 for all adults, regardless of age or medical conditions. The other thing the IOM has estimated somewhere around the neighborhood of 95% of all American males and 75% of all American women exceed well in amount, well over, um, the UL for sodium on a daily basis, meaning as a culture, we consume significantly more sodium than we really should. So where does our sodium typically come from? Well, about 75% of, of our salt intake really comes from processed foods, whether it's canned goods, prepackaged foods, prepared foods from fast food restaurants. These things are loaded with salt and about three quarters of all the salt that you consume on a regular basis comes from these processed foods very little of it a small minority of it actually comes from um, the foods that we consume and from cooking and that what we that which we add uh, afterwards a lot of it's coming um, a lot of it's coming from these processed foods so what can we do um, well try to avoid canned goods try to avoid processed foods eat fresh produce eat fresh vegetables and don't add salt to things and there are also other alternatives to utilizing salt there are salt replacers uh, that are out there that you can use to season foods you can also look up um, and you can actually find that there are numerous other um, numerous other things that you can add to your food that aren't sodium based uh, that can give your food a much better flavor without adding increased sodium content. Um, as I said, there is data out there that suggests that high levels of sodium um, can lead to hypertension, although there are other studies that have been done that show no link whatsoever. So this is something that's an area of, of active investigation at this point. So now we're going to talk about chloride. You can think of chloride as sodium's negatively charged shadow because wherever sodium goes, chloride seems to go along with it. And the reason for this is actually kind of simple. Sodium is a cation, so wherever it goes, it's bringing positive charges with it. We don't necessarily want to have charges present. We don't want that gradient to exist in a lot of places, so what do we do? We send a negatively charged chloride anion with it. So chloride is sodium sort of negatively charged companion, if you will. And if you think about it, the majority of ways that we get sodium in our body is through the consumption of table salt, which is sodium chloride. So it often comes into your body at the same time as sodium. And correspondingly, uh, the uh, IOM's AI for chloride is right around 2300 milligrams, which means if you just simply consume an adequate amount of table salt to get your sodium, you're also getting basically the right amount of chloride. So what does chloride do? Well, it aids in fluid balance, right? Because wherever sodium goes, chloride is going with it. So it's acting as another electrolyte that's attracting water. So it's helping to maintain that fluid balance. The other thing that chloride is really good at doing is um, it, it's, it's good for, it's important for um, mucus secretion, okay? So uh, in tissues such as the gastrointestinal tract um, and, and the lungs, there are these dedicated chloride channels that are utilized to help uh, produce and release mucus. Um, it's also essential uh, in the pancreas for the release of pancreatic juices that aid in digestion. And one of the best ways to understand how important chloride actually is to our body is actually to study a disease in which chloride transport is impaired. Um, one such disease is cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis is an inherited genetic condition uh, that mainly is found in people of European descent. And people with cystic fibrosis have a mutation that deforms their chloride channel so they don't do their job very efficiently. 
people that have cystic fibrosis um, have a host of, of signs and symptoms. Um, one of them is sticky mucus production in the lungs that can make it difficult to breathe at times. It also renders them susceptible to bacterial infections. They have problems with nutrient absorption um, and often either have stunted growth or delayed growth or never reach sort of like their full mature size in some, in some cases. They can also be malnourished as a result of, of this. Um, they can also be infertile and have other uh, and have uh, have other system wide issues. Why? Because of how important chloride is to many of these physiologic processes. Chloride is also important for acid base regulation. Um, so chloride is a negatively charged ion. Uh, it's an anion. Why is this important? Well, pH is really tied to the number of positive and negative charges that are in a solution. Um, when you look at your blood, for example, there are three major components that are negatively charged. It's chloride. Um, it's also another ion known as bicarbonate and a protein uh, that's known as albumin. Uh, all of these represent sort of the major negative charges that counterbalance those positive charges. And since the pH of your blood is around 7, that neutral pH, um, if you have an, an imbalance of chloride, you might end up shifting your blood pH, which could also be problematic. There are homeostatic mechanisms that help to keep uh, blood pH fairly normal, but messing with your chloride concentration can make that process more challenging. It's also important because your body produces um, an acid called hydrochloric acid and leaches it into the stomach. This is what keeps the pH of your stomach between 2 and 4 um, very, very acidic. Why? Well, this helps to break down the foods that you eat. It also has an antimicrobial property. Um, most pathogenic bacteria that enter into your stomach, things that enter uh, that you eat, consume, or enter through your mouth, they end up in that acid pit of your stomach and they end up dying, which means they can't really cause an infection. So it plays an important role in terms of your immune system. Similarly, white blood cells as well as red blood cells use chloride for various other purposes. So they're essential for the normal functioning. So chloride is essential for the normal functioning of those cells as well. So where are you getting your chloride from? Like I said before, chloride is sort of sodium's companion. Uh, you're going to get your chloride probably through the consumption of salt, just like you get your sodium. Sodium is very easily absorbed, similar to the way sodium is absorbed in the intestine. As I said, wherever sodium goes, chloride is going to kind of passively follow it. So when sodium is absorbed in the small intestine or reabsorbed in the kidney, chloride is also going with it, which means your body's pretty good at holding on to chloride anions, similar to the way it's very good at holding on to and absorbing sodium cations. The last electrolyte I'd like to talk about is potassium. So if sodium is the positively charged ion we find outside of cells, potassium is the one that we're going to find inside of cells. So remember that sodium potassium ATPase is keeping potassium levels high in all of your cells, just as it's keeping sodium levels high outside of all your cells. So what is potassium involved in? Well, as I mentioned before, potassium is important in terms of your fluid and your fluid balance, right? So when your body detects high levels of sodium or in or high, low levels of uh, low levels of potassium, this is sort of an indication that there is a fluid imbalance. And one of the things that can happen is um, is the adrenal glands are going to start producing um, hormones, aldosterone, that's going to trigger fluid uptake, and it's going to chart recharge, and it's going to um, it's going to sense that your body needs to uh, sort of reuptake sodium and so on and so forth. The problem is this: your the way your kidneys work is that when um, when they need to reabsorb potassium or when they need to reabsorb sodium it actually comes at the expense of potassium. So as your kidneys are trying to maintain fluid balance by reabsorbing sodium, it's going to do that by booting out potassium into your urine, which means you lose about 200 milligrams of potassium every day um, just simply through maintaining a constant sodium level in your bloodstream, which your body finds to be very, very important. So that's kind of the role that, that potassium plays there in getting exchanged for sodium to maintain fluid and electrolyte balance. As I mentioned before, potassium is also involved in nerve impulses, right? So if sodium is the gas pedal, right? Sodium rushes in, it's the gas pedal activating that nerve transmission. Potassium is the brakes. As sodium is rushing in, potassium is rushing out. It's dissipating that charge that's coming into the cell. It's blunting that signal and eventually can shut it completely down so that the cell can reset for the next nerve impulse. If we didn't have that process, it would take much longer to reset your neurons, which means it would take much longer for your the next transmission to be sent. It would slow down your reactions and slow down those impulses from occurring. So you need sodium to counterbalance that, or you need potassium to counterbalance that sodium. Potassium is also involved in a number of other biological processes. Uh, for example, it's involved uh, in protein synthesis um, and some other enzymatic 
uh, reactions that occur. So potassium plays in a number of different roles, uh, in, in also in acid base, um, in SEO base homeostasis, potassium is also involved in that. So potassium has numerous roles. So hypokalemia can be caused in a number of different ways. First off, it could be caused by low potassium intake, but that's pretty rare. It can also be in, it can also be uh, caused by high sodium intake. So remember, there's a trade-off, right? If your body's going to reabsorb sodium to maintain a constant level, it's going to boot out potassium. So if you're getting in too much sodium, it actually can result in uh, deficiency in potassium. But more often than not, um, potassium uh, the hypokalemia can be the result of, of fluid imbalances and basically you're shedding too much of it in your urine, too much urine production, okay? Um, so uh, so what can happen in your hypokalemic? You can get muscle, uh, you know, muscle cramps, um, you know, nausea, that type of stuff. But one of the things that can actually happen is it can, can cause dysfunctions in the heart. You can get like heart palpitations or heart arrhythmias as a result of hypokalemia. Hyperkalemia, um, which is often the result predominantly of kidney dysfunctions. Your body's not handling the balance of potassium like it's supposed to. Um, potassium begins to accumulate. This also can have a pretty profound effect on the heart. What can actually happen is the potassium begins to interfere um, with the electrical impulses that are triggered by neurons that control your heart rhythm. Now you won't notice any overt signs and symptoms until your heart stops. So too much potassium can actually stop your heart because it interferes with those nerve impulses. So hyperkalemia can be a real problem as well. Where do we get potassium from? Well, potassium comes from our diet. Um, you actually need significantly more potassium than you do sodium or chloride. The main reason being uh, that potassium, actually you lose much more of it. It's not, um, it's, it's not retained as well as sodium and chloride is, uh, so you need to get more in because you're losing some of it uh, in your urine because of the trade-off of maintaining sodium balance. Uh, where do you get it from in foods? Produce. So uh, vegetables and fruits are often very high in potassium. The one thing to recognize is this. Potassium is very easy to lose because of how soluble it is. That means that cooking, um, cooking vegetables, boiling them, that type of stuff, you're quite often going to lose a lot of the potassium that's contained within them. Um, canned, uh, canned vegetables and canned fruits are also particularly bad because you have to heat those uh, in order to make them safe for the canning process, and a lot of that potassium is lost. The best way to get potassium is to eat fresh vegetables, and if you can't eat fresh vegetables, frozen um, is significantly better at retaining uh, the potassium than, uh, than canned goods are and overly cooked, uh, overly cooked fruits and vegetables. So as you can see from this entire conversation, maintaining water, adequate water content and maintaining the adequate intake of electrolytes is hugely important for maintaining a healthy lifestyle. Water is key to all that, right? So water is the basis for all this. Without water, you don't have the solvent you need to dissolve those electrolytes and produce the bodily, body fluids that you need. Fortunately, getting an access to clean and healthy water, at least in the United States, um, is, is fairly easy. In 1974, Congress passed the, the Safe Drinking Water Act, and it was signed into law by President Gerald Ford at the end of that year. Um, this charged, uh, this charged um, the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, um, with creating guidelines and protocols for ensuring that the 100,000 plus municipal water systems uh, found in the United States are providing um, all of their customers with safe and healthy drinking water. It put guidelines about the number of things and what can actually be present in our drinking water, but it also put safeguards in place to make sure that our water is free from um, potentially harmful pathogens uh, like bacteria and protozoa that could harm us. And that's a good thing because um, not getting a significant amount of water in our diet or getting too much can be problematic. The other thing we should realize that in the United States, we are fairly lucky. There are billions of people in the world that do not have access to safe and healthy drinking water. And if people don't have access to drinking water, that can create a lot of problems. Now, briefly, we did talk about what can happen if you get too much water, right? You end up with hyponatremia, which could be potentially fatal. But getting too little water or low hydration status, also known as dehydration, can be very problematic as well. And when you are dehydrated, um, that can lead to a host of problems because essentially what's happening is the water is going away and you're ending up with high levels of high concentrations of these ions around and it can be, uh, it can actually be fatal. One of the ways in which dehydration can be fatal is known as heat stroke. So heat stroke occurs when the body temperature exceeds 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Now obviously this can happen for a variety of reasons, but the most common of which is being exposed to a high temperature environment for too long or doing too much, um, sort, too much sort of aerobic activity. 
Remember, the main way in which our body cools itself down is by secreting a water-based fluid known as sweat. But what happens when there is not enough fluid in your body? What happens when your body can't produce sweat? Well, eventually it can't cool itself down. And as a result, uh, essentially what happens is your body becomes dehydrated. Signs and symptoms of, of heat stroke um, are obviously a very, very warm body temperature. But the other thing that can happen is that person might not be sweating anymore. Why? They have no water. Um, they're, they're dehydrated at that point. And as a result, they can't actually produce sweat. So look for dry skin, despite the fact that the person should be sweating and is burning up. Then they can get muscle cramps. They can eventually pass out and they can die if left untreated. And the, the thing you need to do with somebody that has heat stroke is you need to cool them down immediately, get them out of the situation, um, cooling packs, get them into the shade, and then get them fluids. You need to get them water to replace the fluids that they're missing at that point. And even then, uh, if not treated properly, it can be fatal. Dehydration can actually start to manifest its effects when you lose as little as 2% of the, of the water that should be present in your body. So I hope you can see in this video uh, just how important water is and how central it is to life, but also how important those things that are dissolved in water actually are to maintain our fluid and our electrolyte balance. Today we talked a lot about how important water is. We talked about how water is the solvent that creates many of the biological fluids that exist in our body. Some of the most important things we find dissolved in these bodily fluids are electrolytes, sodium, potassium, and chloride. They play many important roles and therefore maintaining adequate levels and the appropriate amounts of these substances in our body is essential. I hope you learned a lot from this video. I hope you'll tune into my next one. Thanks so much for paying attention. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.